I'll call the meeting to order. It is 7 o'clock. Uh, first item are the minutes of February 4th, 2020. Is there a motion? I move to approve the minutes of February 4th, 2020. Second. Uh, page one. One thing under number four, uh, Lake Iroquois Association cleanup discussion, sentence, sorry, second line. The sentence reads, uh, updated the select board on the permitted, permitting for use of herbicide in the lake to eradicate. And I don't believe they have any in, uh, thoughts that they'll actually be able to eradicate Eurasian milfoil. So I'm wondering if health control, control would be a better control word. Control is better. Better term there. <coughs> Page two. All right, I have two things on page two. Under number six, the uh, Chittenden Solid Waste District update. Last sentence reads, the proposed changes will not impact the host town agreement. The first part um, I'm having issue with that sentence is the proposed changes. There was only one change that would affect the host town agreement. That's with the organics diversion facility. So associating with, with both facilities isn't correct. Um, so it should say something like um, uh, the proposed <coughs> Organics diversion facility changes will not affect or will not impact. And then the other part of it is, is while will not impact the host town agreement isn't wrong, um, it doesn't really give what the issue is. And the issue is, is whether they can remain within their limits in the current host town agreement. And their answer is yes. And that's what I'd like the sentence to reflect. So I can provide wording if that would help. Um, I Perhaps if you change instead of impact to violate, would that? Yeah, well, actually, yeah, that does work. Yeah, violate, so sure. Yeah. I have the proposed organics diversion yeah. facility change yeah. will not violate the host town agreement. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, I think that, wow. No wonder you're the, you're the <laughs> town manager. <laughs> Got a little bit of experience. <laughs> <clears throat> And I'm moving on to my next one <coughs> under number seven, uh, no, no, blah, blah, blah. boy, I can't talk tonight for some reason. Noise control ordinance amendment. And under the discussion, it reads, Jeff Ferris said he continues to have an issue with a number of core Saturdays. And I just wonder if down the road somebody will know what core refers to. So I wonder if it should be changed to something like allowed or permitted, permitted. Um, I agree with that one, permitted. Yeah. Yeah, permitted. Okay. Permitted, okay. Okay, good, thank you. <clears throat> Anything else on page two? If not, page three. <clears throat> Hearing no more corrections. All those in favor of approving the minutes of February 4th, 2020 as amended to say aye. 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 Any opposed? No abstentions. It's time for a public comment. And if there's anyone in the audience who wishes to make any comment, uh, any public comment on any issue on the agenda or not, this is your chance. And no hands raised, so we'll move on to our item number four police comfort dog proposal. And Lieutenant Josh Moore is going to. Give us a presentation on that, please. And Chief Foley, by the way, so it too. <laughs> we do have your proposal uh, that was given to us. So. so, oh, right here, okay, good. We got the pages here. Yeah. Okay. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> uh, so before I start, a little about me. So I started here in Wilson in 08. I was promoted to sergeant in 2015. And just recently I was promoted to lieutenant um, back in September. Um, I can tell you in that time frame, I've seen a lot of change in the police department. <laughs> but unfortunately, most of that change has been in personnel. Um, it hasn't been a change in new ideas, new thoughts, new programs. Um, so one thing with the leadership of the chief, he's kind of given me free reign of coming up with different ideas on how to progress the department, how to move forward. Um, and I don't know if come into the times that we're in now. 
Um, so I went to some trainings and met some people from out of state, and this is a, a concept that's being used around the country right now. Um, Mr. Kinney apparently doesn't like comfort dogs, so therapy dogs is what we're going to do. Comfort dogs is fine. Yeah. So this is, it's, it's a new concept. Um, therapy dogs in the normal span of life for people is been going on for a while. Um, 2001 was a big time with 9-11, um, and in the last 10-ish years, they've been starting to be introduced in law enforcement. Uh, the Chittenden County State's Attorney's Office has some personal ones that they use in their office. Um, Wilson Central School has some volunteers that go in as well as go up to UVM Medical Center um, and introduce the dogs to, you know, kids and, and patients up at the hospital. Um, as of right now, I don't know of any other department in the state of Vermont that's using this. Um, like I said, it, it's, it's well documented and being used in other departments out of state. Um, so with that, I say Greenfield Police Department, they were one of the top in beginning this entire program in the nation. Um, so you'll see some slides through them. So with all that said, what is the comfort dog program? What it is, is it's a certified comfort therapy dog that is assigned to a specific officer um, that has training in this field. It's a, you know, we years ago, there was a canine program here in the town of Williston, but it was the old fashioned police canine program. My theory behind that is society nowadays is kind of going away from the attack German Shepherd drug type dogs. It's just not being used as much with marijuana being legal now. You know, a lot of dogs were being used for that purpose. Uh, so the dogs are not being used as much any longer. Um, and changing with the times, we have a lot of issues with police um, and how p police are perceived and everything like that. So a couple of the major issues that we face out there every single day are mental health issues. And how do we bridge that gap between the police department and the community? And when I look at it, this is something that popped up, was bringing in a therapy comfort dog. So when we're interviewing victims of crimes, when we're dealing with children, um, I go back to the tragedy on the interstate, something like that would have been perfect to have this program up and running then when unfortunately, all those teenagers were killed on the interstate. Victims, other witnesses had to go down to the state's attorney's office and testify. This is something that um, an officer in the canine could have gone down there to help calm people's nerves, bring their stress levels down a little bit prior to going in and testifying in front of uh, a room full of people. Um, so the idea is, is to help people in traumatic times communicate with law enforcement. Um, and you know, my thought behind it is, is not only is this gonna be used on a daily basis with domestic violence type crimes, but we could be on call with the school district. The school could call us up because they're having a difficult time trying to get through to a child um, that may be in crisis or may just be doing it, uh, you know, seeking attention. You bring them in, you can sit down with the dog, it can help them calm down and go to a different place in their mind and, and move on from there. Um, so just, I know you guys have the proposal in front of you. Um, I did list out the applications that I see. It's not limited to just this. It could be a wide variety of other things, but these are kind of the, the things that um, popped right up. Uh, you know, investigating when a child is a victim of abuse. Um, you know, we donate, or we don't donate, but we provide a lot of money to Kuzi as it is already, but we don't have an officer assigned to that unit. But there's nothing saying that we could not be on a somewhat of an on-call basis Monday through Friday with Kuzi when they're operating to go in and assist them with any type of call or interview they may be doing. Um, like I said, trial uh, testimony of a, tri of a child or a victim or a witness. Um, the critical incident um, for mental health support, not only can this help out with the people we're dealing with every day, but it can also help with first responders that are going through uh, major stressful incidents or traumatic incidents, so fire department personnel, um, our police department, and you know, statewide. Uh, school support, like I said, community relations, you know, the way, the way I look at this, it's a home run. I mean, you think about all the different community things that we do out there. Um, you know, and, and a lot of times people are a little intimidated by the police. This is kind of helping 
bridge that a little bit where people may feel a little bit more comfortable coming up to an officer, speaking to an officer, engaging with that officer. Um, so that's kind of one of those things. And then the Community Justice Board, I, I've already spoken to Krista Lee. She predicted that she thinks about 75% of her clientele would probably ask to use this resource if it was available. Um, obviously being in-house, that would be perfect to do and it could be something scheduled around. So those are just kind of the, the highlight ideas when this may be used. Um, we've done quite a bit of work on this program on how we make it go from an idea to an actual concept. Um, Boonfield Labradors down in uh, New Hampshire would be our top choice. Uh, we've already spoken to them. They have said that they will donate a puppy 100% cost free. They'll also um, get it up and running for us um, for the certification portions of it. There are a couple other hero pups and puppies behind bars. Um, they also have it, but as of right now, that would be our first choice. Um, then it comes into how do we do obedience training and, and who does that and how much does that cost? <coughs> Tom Radford was a canine handler in Burlington. He had several dogs. He's still part of the canine um, group for the state of Vermont for law enforcement. He lives right here in town and he's also his new company, now he's retired. Uh, is called Thin Blue Line Canine. He's already committed to donating 100% of all of the obedience training and any other training that would need to be done for there. Um, there is some uh, therapy certifications which any normal citizen can go to and have that done. It, it, it's, it's minor, $35, $45 to get the, a dog certified. Um, the feeding, the food. Um, Guy's Farm and Yard, we've already reached out to. They said that they would donate all the food for the, the canine 100%. Also Agway, the prior owner of Agway committed to doing it as well. It's been turned over. He felt that they would probably do the same. Um, and PetSmart also has a canine program that donates nationwide. Um, the medical expenses, uh, Mountain View Animal Hospital. If you look in there in the proposal, it actually spells out a little bit. Most of the, the things would be 100% covered for the animal. Um, for the length of its life. Um, they did suggest having a $1,500 a year uh, kitty fund for the animal. Um, as of right now, we're, we wouldn't be asking for any money. Um, through our forfeiture account, there's plenty of money to, to fund that $1,500 amount for the length of the actual animal's life. We don't think that, and, and the $1,500 is for emergency incidents, so um, you know, obviously that would not be taken um, every year um, but what we would do is if you go down to the donors portion of it we would open up a bank account for the canine program um, and it would be for businesses and individuals who wish to donate for the animal and the program um, this money would only be used for the canine and the canine program and just taking a shot in the dark I think it would be a success and I think it would be a little bit overwhelming on how much donations would come in for it um, so the thought behind it is, is to open up like an Instagram and Facebook account where the dog then could, if there was an excess of money, donate it to organizations on the dog's behalf. Um, through the slides that Rick is kind of just poking around on, Greenfield, like I said, they have two of them. And um, what they do is they've been to Sandy Hook during the Sandy Hook massacre in Las Vegas during the shootings. Um, they go down to Times Square in New York City for major incidents. Um, so they travel around the entire country, which if there's an abundance of money, there's nothing saying that we couldn't send that officer and that dog to different areas around to help support first responders and any other victims. Um, they still actually go down, they're close, so they go to the Boston bombing. Um, they went down for the Boston bombing, but they do go down for the marathon um, just in, as just a presence. Um, so that's kind of that. There is the, the canine insurance that, you know, that was one thing that we had a question about. I went to Eric. Uh, VL, uh, VLCT has said that there would be no additional cost. There would be no special insurance for this type of a dog. Um, and everything would be covered under our standard insurance plan. Um, and then we just did a canine handler uh, selection process. So we wouldn't be asking for a new position. It would be a specialized position with the officers that we already have. Um, we would use it, we would go about it as any other lateral or promotional process where the officers would submit any type of resumes. There'd be an interview process with them um, and then somebody would be assigned to it. 
Um, ideally, the hope is that it would be a Monday through Friday position. Um, so it would actually help out once we're fully staffed that we'll actually have an additional officer on the road Monday through Friday. Um, but at the same time, they'll have this specialized training and canine where they can be available to go out in the community during school hours and, and business hours. So that's, that's a quick overview of the actual proposal of it. Um, if you just look up, some of these are just um, different canines that are being used around the country right now. Uh, as you can see, most of the dates on those are, are recent, 2018, 2019, because it's becoming more common now that these police departments are doing it. Mass State Police just got theirs from um, the Boone Field where we would be looking to get. Um, but I give credit to Greenfield because I wasn't going to rewrite something that they've already done because they have a track record of doing it well, and uh, so I give them all the credit to this, but they have, uh, their dogs aren't gonna be Labradors like what we would want. Uh, but like I said, they've gone all over the country for different type of uh, major incidents to give support, so. Good. <coughs> so yes, we're not asking for any money, any additional people, anything like that. It would be 100% funded on its own. And like I said, I believe that it's actually going to have a surplus of money, which then actually gives us a little bit of a latitude on how we want to go move that uh, program forward. So. You've done a good, good job in, uh, with all the background stuff and uh, presentation. So is there, are there questions from the board? Just a comment. I mean, as a <coughs> former therapy dog owner, as someone who attends the police canine balls regularly, and <coughs> who has a therapy dog in the office, I can't say enough good things about your program. You'd have my full support, absolutely. Also, if you need some other folks that would put your cause on their list of possible contributions, Chief, feel free to reach out to me because I have a number of them in the community who would be more than happy to add that on. A question, or a comment and a question. Um, I'm <coughs> very impressed with just all the background research that's done, uh, obviously this is valuable program and I, I would fully support that as well I just uh, like during the week weekends where's where's the dog house who takes care of so it'd be, it'd be run like any other police canine so it would be owned by the department and when that officer isn't working it's a family pet so that officer brings a dog home and, and you know any other that was my assumption but I just wanted yeah, to know it yeah. and that's how it goes and you know yeah. um, the nice thing with these types of dogs is they don't technically ever really retire like a canine patrol dog yeah. they have a short lifespan and once that lifespan's over it goes to the officer and it lives with the officer as a pet this is something that could be in use for the whole length of the yeah. animal's yeah. life so for sure. yeah. Yeah. So thanks a lot of canine officers get a slightly increase a slight increase in pay um, is that anticipated here too for taking care of the dog? Something that we would look at, I, I, you know, what my, my thought process behind it is we've, we've always had two detective spots um, and those are Monday through Friday positions. Um, there is a step increase with that, which is a 2%. My thought is, is as of right now, looking at the department, I don't believe that we need those two spots filled with the workload. My, my hope is, is that we could take one of those spots and flip it into this canine position. Um, so that way there's no additional cost anywhere. It's, it's, it's already built in and, you know, it'd be the same schedule um, and it's a specialty. It, you know, and a lot of times the type of calls that maybe a detective may be investigating, this canine would be there anyways. Uh, major domestic violence type cases, sexual assault type cases, anything like that. Plus with the training, you know, this. It, we're, we're regular canine pro, you're constantly going every month to do your training, and then it, you know, then you have your certification. Where it's, it's not as intense, you know, you get the basic therapy training and all that, and there might be refreshes, but it's not a constant. Every month you're out of the office for eight to how many hours? So my, my daughter actually participated in a training uh, for uh, Officer Huey in Colchester with his dog. Um, mm -hmm. She hid in the woods and the dog found her, and um, I think she actually probably uh, helped hide drugs in her room, too. Um, uh, but uh, I saw they were, they, were, they were in a sealed box, so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, actually, and I, I, there are a lot of different uses for this. Uh, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. And what we would do is have the, the elementary schools for naming the dogs for us. So they get the schools already involved and help themselves. Yeah, so I didn't mention 
Boonfield will donate like a two or three year old dog that's already certified. But I just, I kind of like going the puppy route because I think with the schools, if we could time it some right, you know, you, you bring the, the dog into the schools and do assemblies and you, you help, you know, the dog's not named, but you allow the students and the schools to actually help name the dog. Um, and I've already talked to the schools and, uh, you know, they, they want to be involved as much as they can, so. So, um, a little hesitant to admit this on the camera, but I am not a large dog uh, lover. Um, so I may not share the same insights that others on the board um, have about this program, so I apologize for that. My questions should not be at all interpreted that I'm in any way opposed to it. It's just I feel I need to ask questions and make sure I understand. And you know, based on the information you provided and, and talked about tonight, there will be no budget that is needed for this program. And I guess my question is, is how certain are we of that? And, and let me just give you, a, for instance, of that is um, in the past, we might have been able to get a grant to hire a new police officer. In a sense, that's free money, and that's a good thing if you need a police officer. And I guess my point about this is, is that while some of these today might be f folks who are willing to donate things like food or medical supplies or that type of thing. In the future, if they're not available, what can we expect the cost of this program to be? And my philosophy about this is, if we're gonna run a program, a, a program like this, it isn't a thing we do from year to year. Next year, we're not gonna be like, oh, should we run the program again? Once we make the commitment, we should make the commitment on some sort of a long-term basis. So I want to make sure that down the road, if these things um, no longer are available because of, you know, the donations have dried up or whatever, you know, what are the potential costs to the town? And just to make sure that, you know, we're aware of what that could be. So I I'm guess I'm asking is, can you provide information along that line? Yeah, I mean, it would be tough for me to predict what's going to happen in the future yeah. if you're trying to get to a cost basis, especially with food and medical. I can tell you the medical is not going to change. I, I can't imagine that the, the veterinary clinic would close. Um, you know, the procurement of the animal would would, ne would never come into effect later on. The training would not need to be done differently. Um, so, yeah, from my it would be any excess medical expense and food type stuff. Um, looking at how our budget is already done. With our forfeiture money, you know, I feel confident that if something arose, we would be able to cover it and cover it for many, many years that it wouldn't be um, requiring us to come asking for money for it. Let me ask a question in a slightly different way, and maybe this is pointed a little bit more at Eric and, and Rick, is in next year's budget, next year's meaning fiscal year 2022, believe it or not, um, would you see this being built in as a line item, even though it would show that zero expenditures are likely required for it? Zero expenditures, then no. It would not make sense to have this line item because there's nothing to show for it. Well, because down the road in future years, you might have the same light on, but want to show that, hey, this year. I still wouldn't, even if, it, and, and here's why. Um, I, I think that the annual expenses if you were to total them up, um, would be less than $5,000 a year. And it doesn't make sense to create a separate line item. I could see maybe including it in some other line item if you have a list of expenses, but not its own line item. Okay. And then the, the, the issue with um, there being an officer who essentially has to adopt this dog, I guess might be a way to put it, because uh, they're bringing it home at times and when they're not here, uh, um, you know, working. What is, help me out here, what is the potential that that will happen or correspondingly that there's a chance that there wouldn't be an officer who is willing to do that? Well, then we'd have to evaluate, but this is, if, if this gets approved, it's not something that's gonna happen tomorrow. Um, there's waiting lists for the litters for these dogs to come out because now it's becoming such a high profile type thing for law enforcement agencies. So there's gonna be some time. Um, 
I, but I, I don't foresee that. I already have several officers that are 100% committed that, that want to take on the position, so. I have a kind of a, a related question. Uh, there were quite a few years ago, and Jeff was on the board at the time, the select board did approve a canine. It was a different kind. It was, right. Uh, and it, the program never really got off the ground, partly because the person, the officer that um, we had kind of pegged to have the dog and was interested moved to another department or something, I think. Um, so what happens if we uh, get a comfort dog or therapy dog, assign it to a particular officer, and then that officer leaves? It's, as you said earlier, it's the department, department dog. Department so then dog. I would assume that dog would then come back and get assigned to another person. Unfortunately, with this type of a canine, it, could, it technically could have multiple handlers. So it wouldn't be a specific person that's been training with this dog for three years, 10 years, however long it may be. So that's why there are some departments that actually have an officer bring their personally owned dog in. I just see that that could cause more issues than not. Um, so yeah, that's why we would go this route. That, that's very different then than a, a, another kind of dog that's trained for searches or for drug right. um, detection or something like that. The last is, uh, I assume we're, we're going to have a vote on this, and I just wanted to let you know my, my position is, is when we have something new before us, I don't like to vote on it that night, and I consider this new. I just learned about this program when I picked up my select board packet pretty recently. Um, so I ask that there be a two-week, we call it the two-week rule, just hopefully so we get a lot of positive feedback from either a newspaper article or folks who saw us tonight on channel 17 um, which helps with our decision yeah so we actually we haven't this is like first step stuff right. so we haven't gone to media or anybody like that right. it's, it's been in-house and and next door here to rick um, so this is kind of the i just brought that up because there is suggested a motion to approve it and i'm would rather wait uh to do that if the board chooses there's no urgency right. on this issue at this point in time and then the last thing sorry and Maybe, Chief, it's best to ask this question of you. I heard tonight that there might be some reconsideration of whether there's an, and maybe I heard it wrong, that's what I want, I'm checking right now, of two sergeants' positions in the police department? No, we have two BCI detectives' positions that are vacant, detectives' position. Detectives, okay. So we would use, right now, every officer carries their own workload, investigative and all that, something serious, the lieutenant helps them out, all the sergeants on duty. So we're still too short. So those two BCI positions are still vacant. So we're in the process of trying to fill and get us up to 17th Swan that we would create one detective's position, the lieutenant would oversee the BCI positions, and then the second position would fall to a comfort therapy slash officer that does okay. that. Okay, okay, I think that helps. Again, like this is a work in progress. It's a proposal before the board tonight. You know, we've told everybody, and I've been telling them since I've been here for two and a half years, is that once we get up to full strength, the 17th Swan, and we've been there twice for 24 hours, <laughs> then we, we, we brought back. But again, it's a work in progress, but I think it gives us time to, to make it work the way we want it to work and not rush into it. So it's just, you know, the process of building out a new program. From my viewpoint, programs like this provide some extra incentives for our officers. Right. It provides a little variety, a little interest, and I think that in the long term that can serve as a recruitment tool. Yeah. So it's more than just the benefit of having the dog serving the community. It's also a, a benefit to our officers in general, I think. And please don't get me wrong. I, I, it's not that I don't see the benefit. I just don't think I ha can see it through the same eyes as some of the other. I, 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 I don't own dogs. I've never owned a dog. I'll never own a dog. So, no, I understand where you're coming from. So interesting. You're the one who brought this forward. And, and the reason that I do it is because when I look at where we're at and what's going on around us, we can either just continue to be active out in the community and respond to calls or we can try to do stuff that's proactive and that's going to actually make a change so it's kind of where where do we want to be and who do we want to be if you know nobody in vermont has this program do we want to be a leader or do we just want to stay stagnant and, and do nothing 
And, and our, you know, you mentioned the community justice program. We also have the community outreach program. And, and with this program, if it, it, it gets approved, it shows a whole different way of policing that's evolving here in our community and in other communities as well. So I absolutely agree. Thank you. Any further questions? Is the board in agreement to hold us off until the next meeting, which is actually a month from now, not two weeks? I'm but. actually <laughs> not. I'd like to propose a motion. And with all due respect to you, yeah. I just I would like to be on the leading edge of this, and I particularly appreciate, officer, that you don't have a dog. Yeah. I never intend to have a dog. Yeah, I, I, that <laughs> brings a whole different thing for me for this. So <laughs> I I personally don't want to wait. I would put a motion on the table. So a motion is in order. I'd move to implement a comfort dog program at the Wilston Police Department. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second. Right. <clears throat> motion is seconded, and is your discussion on the motion? Just that I'm not sure what two weeks would do. I mean, I, I guess that's where I was coming from. They do nothing. Um, we may receive absolutely no comments. I just think it's, um, it's the right thing to do. Um, uh, this puts me in an awkward position because I don't want to vote against it, um, but I'm also not ready to vote for it, so I'm actually going to abstain. If I might say something sure. while you're discussing, if you go to our Facebook page, we're doing stuff with rescue dogs also, uh, and try and encourage people to adopt rescue dogs, and we're, we're getting so many positive hits that they think it's a great idea what we're doing. So, so if you go to our Wilson PD right. Facebook page, right. you'll I have no doubts that the number of positive comments we would get if we were to receive comments about this compared to any, let's say, negative ones would be overwhelming. Nonetheless, I still think it's important to have that opportunity for the public to have an input on this, uh, on decisions such as this. That's just my standpoint. Is there any further discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? One, One abstention. So the motion carries, and thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> so move on to uh, the memorandum of understanding with the Dorothy Allen Memorial Library. And Rick, uh, you have so given us a copy of the yes. proposal. So the board's seen a copy of this several times, I believe. And it's been a, a work in progress as we move through this process. Uh, the version you have before you now uh, was reviewed by our legal counsel. One of the main changes was actually we added a bunch of whereases, uh, which I, I was going to add anyway because I, I think it does help set the context for yep. the agreement. Um, this draft agreement that you have before you has been reviewed by the library trustees. There was one key issue um, that I wanted to discuss with the trustees, and I think I mentioned this when I last chatted with the board here, and that was the issue about uh, if there's a grievance filed by the library, a library employee, how does that process work? And the draft version that you saw before said that if the, um, we would follow the personnel policy, up to the point where the manager makes a decision, and then if the employee wants to go to the next step, then it is appealed to, and the last version said the Library Board of Trustees. Um, our legal counsel suggested that it be the select board, uh, and after I thought about it, I, it actually made a lot of sense to me, so I discussed this with the Library of Trustees, and they agreed with that change, and, and the reason they agreed with that was, first of all, it's the select board that sets the policy to begin with. And it kind of makes sense if there's a grievance concerning that policy that it's the select board that would be adjudicating that. Secondly, uh, when you're making decisions like this um, among an employee group, you <coughs> want some sort of consistency. And if you have two different boards making decisions, then you can have potentially inconsistent applications of the roles. And so it really made sense to have one board making those decisions. And they agreed with that. It was, um, you know, there was no big controversy from their viewpoint on that issue. Um, so the version you have before them, they are um, um, set to approve, as I understand at their next meeting. They have not approved it at this point. But that's just because that 
they, uh, it was on their agenda just for discussion and, and not for approval. Um, so, um, and they, we did have a couple minor changes that um, they made at the meeting and it's been incorporated in the version that you have in front of you. So. Okay, now questions for Rick. That actually was my, my question. <laughs> No, no questions. Not to approve it. Pardon me. I said I am not seeing a reason not to approve it. Sure. Any other other questions for Rick? If not, a motion is in order on this one as well. I'd move to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the trustees of the Dorothy Allen Memorial Library as presented. <clears throat> Is there any discussion on the motion? Actually, I did. Ha sorry, I have one question. If the town charter is not approved, this doesn't matter. This doesn't affect us one way or the other. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? No abstentions. I have a signature page. Okay. <clears throat> And moving on then to us. the building use policy update. And, uh, Eric, I think you're taking care of this. Yep. So the, this policy <clears throat> defines parameters for using our town facilities, uh, namely this room, fire department meeting room, police department community room. It was adopted in 2007 and uh, <laughs> it's been on one of our um, lists for legislative policies to just have, a, have an update here. It's been about 13 years, just a, a few, few minor things you'll see with the red lines. Um, we had listed before the annex as a space, and we typically don't allow uh, groups to use that. It's okay. more of an internal meeting space. And the library is listed, um, and really the library manages renting out their space. It's um, contained in the library operating bylaws, how that space is used. It's, it's all aligned with, with what we do for the other facilities, and they manage renting that space, or not renting, but reserving that space, rather. And it's uh, like there's these other meeting spaces, it's very busy and in high demand as, as well to use. Um, the permitted uses, you'll see some things are rearranged in this section. And the major addition here is to add language um, to qualify group must be organized or affiliated with a recognized charity or private foundation uh, turned by a 501c3 status. And we had a couple instances over the years where groups that didn't have this status, they're more of a private interest group or, or looking to use the space. So this just adds um, clarity and policy to that. And we still have language for exceptions granted on a case-by-case -case basis if, if something were to come up. For the reservations piece, you'll see the red lines are just more procedurally. We, we really have people use our online form now. <laughs> Those are the major pieces to this that staff proposes. But certainly, if the board has additional changes, we can work those in. Questions for Eric? <laughs> so you answered my one question why the town hall annex was being deleted. Um, my other question is and I remember back when this was first adopted, we had discussion about what if there were an organization that had, I don't know how to correctly describe them, but it was more based on hate than it was based on any you know, positive message or something like that. And does this provide us with the opportunity to say no to an organization that might be viewed as distasteful by most? Is that a good way to, did I make myself clear? Because I don't even know how to talk about these things really. I think I understand the question, and I guess the answer is um, no, this doesn't address that, and it shouldn't. Um, okay. it, we have freedom of speech in this country, and if we have a, an open public space that we'd let, as long as it meets the criteria in that policy, then the message shouldn't be, I mean, it may be distasteful, and people may object to it, but people have a right to speak, and um, if we're opening up our spaces for public use, and if it's, as I said, if it fits the criteria, then they should be able to use it, regardless of the message. OK. 
Okay, so the part that talks about professional uh, associations uh, which wholly or in part benefit Willis Willison residents' employees would not be a reason to say no. Well, I don't know. What, I'm trying to envision what kind of organization you would that would fit the criteria and at the same time be a, a yeah. let's say we'll call it a fringe um, group um, that has a message that is distasteful to most. Um, I mean, there, I can think of a number of organizations that, um, whether they or not they fit any of the criteria that we have, I don't know. Yeah, okay. But the general policy about, um, for, you know, I get your point. Yeah. based on the message yeah. is, is our answer is no, we don't discriminate on that. Okay. So it would change in um, under permitted uses, the, the five num numbered paragraphs. Uh, at the end of paragraph four, I would change the and to an or. Yeah, all those criteria you have to be a town board and a service organization and a government and a, I don't know. Question on the um, last page under reservations, where the at the end of the uh, the new language that says by making a reservation by calling the town office. I just any one in particular, or just a a department of the town uh, should be contacted, or it, typically it, the manager's office is contract uh, contacted, but we have um, staff in the listers offices tend to manage that. It's kind of, the responsibilities change hands sometimes. Um, so I left it more generic, but we, we could put it under manager's office to I, I ultimate authority to on it. What we're bringing this up is somebody calls, they get an automatic reservation and dial it, punch it if you want to reach reservations. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how many requests we get though. There are yeah. multiple yeah. requests every, almost every day. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I would not have rooms, guessed that. High demand. The rooms are in very high demand. Okay. And, and you can see on the town website on the calendar for any of these outside groups using the spaces, it's it's updated by the staff person who books these. So you can you get a snapshot every week yeah. of all the different groups that are, are using these spaces. Okay. So they're, they're valuable to the community. <clears throat> any other questions or comments regarding the building use policy? Nope. We could probably do a motion tonight, uh, just incorporating into the motion the changes that we've made tonight. I would move to amend the town building use policy as amended. Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Moving on to the groundwater, uh, groundwater control ordinance. Eric. So this is another um, we've had on our on our docket spring forward for a little bit. Here. Some background: This is over on Commerce Avenue in, in 2010. It was designated a Superfund site by the EPA. Um, there was a business that caused significant groundwater contamination um, years ago. So this, just to be clear, there's there was no urgency to do this. Um, it was a suggestion for the town um, to consider by the EPA at the time, um, just an extra precaution. Um, the entire area is also on town water. I, I confirm that with Public Works. So we, we used an example, um, kind of a basis from Connecticut that, that we had to structure something like this for, for an ordinance in place. And you'll see Article 5, the area affected. I have, um, I've reached out to the EPA and thankfully the person who was listed on this um, investigation sheet I've included in your packet, still works there. I sent her, <laughs> found her in the directory, sent her an email. She got right back to me too that day. Um, so my main question right now is the delineation of this area, um, the control zone. And you'll see on the third page, um, you get a visual. Um, with black and white, it's in printout gray, but you'll see the, the circle kind of delineating where they looked at in 2010. Um, I'm looking for some language and guidance from the EPA, and they also need we want to define this area if we need to 
call out every parcel specifically, or how would you delineate it for a form ordinance like this? So. Looking for their advice before writing that language in, but the framework is, is here for the board tonight that goes through um, our standard sets with it with an ordinance <coughs> like this. The major piece to this is establishing this zone and then having these use regulations for no extraction, consumption, or utilization of, of groundwater for any, for any purpose within this area. That's uh, just kind of a starting point for it, but look for guidance from the board uh, on the direction of this and where, where we should go with it. As I recall that area did have wells. Um, it did have, yes. Um, This ordinance would have had a whole lot uh, more importance if we didn't have, um, if the air wasn't served by water. And they were at the, at the time of the, uh, the problem. They were, a number of them were served by uh, wells. <clears throat> so I just saw a couple of typos that as long as you're looking at it under Article 3 definition, the uh, maybe next, well, second line. We can serve surface water presence and scratch the S present in aquifers. Let's find it. You find it? Yep. Okay. And the other one I had was on the last page under Article 7, Part B. In addition, a person, firm, or corporation being an owner, I think it should say being an owner or occupant of. Any further questions for Eric tonight? So there's no action to proposed to be taken tonight on this. I think it's a good idea. That it just tangentially related. Years ago, the EPA had a meeting, I recall, in this room. Yeah. Um, where they gave an update because the plume moves, um, and uh, they gave a nice little update about you know whether there was danger to the town, and they said there wasn't, and where it was moving, and how long it would take to clean up, which seemed to be forever. Um, but I'm wondering if that's the kind of thing that they might be invited back to do again, or if that's maybe it's not that big an issue anymore. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea. I can certainly reach out, seeing it's been a decade since this was, mm -hmm. was explored, and the same person is still familiar with this project. And she had mentioned speaking with, I think I believe it was DEC at the state, um, to look at the status of the plume as well. So it seems to be some timely conversation around this. I think that, that's a good idea. The uh, person who worked for the state on this particular site just retired. There will be somebody assigned to it. He did reach out to me once saying they were getting close to taking some action and they'd want to update the select board on that. I assume that hasn't happened. That hasn't why they come in. It's a good idea to reach out to them. And that was actually my question, Eric. Have you reached out to DEC about this? I haven't yet. The person I contacted, um, Ms. Lamuno at EPA. She no. said she had a meeting. I reached out to her last Wednesday. She said she actually had a meeting in Montpelier last Thursday where she was going to discuss this to them. So okay. And, to and this is not my area at all, but um, <clears throat> one of the things I wonder about is do we actually have the ability to do this? And, and hear me out. Is I know that there are, for instance, there's the, the groundwater trust. You know, it's some thing Vermont did and created a groundwater trust. And so I actually kind of wonder if we actually have the ability to supersede the state's interest in um, whatever the right word is, managing groundwater with a, with a local ordinance. I, I just, I, I don't know the answer to that. I could be totally off base, but I just think it's worth looking into. It may be where this would be viewed as being in violation of this groundwater trust. Um, which, because it's the state's <coughs> managing its resources, if you will, even though they're contaminated resources that you don't want anybody using. Um, well, we can certainly check into that. Sure. Yeah. I don't think there's going to be any conflict, but it's worth checking. It, yeah, yeah. I just don't know the answer to that. Um, and then the only other point is, is I assume over time that area that's being monitored, maybe they'll want it to be large enough so that the plume will never reach the edge of that area, but it may change over time. Um, so it's just something to think about. A map may be only a map in a point in time. It may need to change with time. Yeah, I, I, I could see this with 
whatever time period they recommend a, a look at it. Um, you know, if, if it moves, we need to expand the zone, the ordinance could be updated as, as needed. Right, right. Just like we do with some of our ordinance, we add some street to it or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Do you see actually in the past two years recommended some money be put in the capital bill for remediation to uh, match federal funds and they withdrew that request. Um, so it sounds like there may be something coming down the pike and relatively soon yeah. for remediation of the... Uh, they have not started it yet, yeah. Well, it seems yeah. like bringing this up at this point is a timely... Yeah. Right, yeah, your timing yeah. is good, yeah. How'd so, you know? So <laughs> Maybe you'll push them a little bit. bit comment is great. Yeah. Yeah. The only, um, it's a question, not a comment, is that the, it looks like the proposed ordinance is relying on the town's uh, inherent power to govern health, safety, and general welfare. Um, you might want to check with the town lawyer to see if that's if that's uh, a proper call out to the town power or whether it should be more of a zoning type thing or something else. Yeah, we have not had legal counsel look at that. We wanted to give the board first crack at it, and, and then the, the next step before the second reading of this will. We'll have the legal counsel look at it, and we'll do we'll follow up on all the questions that have been raised this evening. Any further questions or comments? If not, we'll move on then to the manager recruitment process. Um, you probably uh, saw a modified uh, agreement that uh, uh, Joy and I actually asked uh, to uh, have some wording changed in the uh, the agreement that we saw two weeks ago, just in order to make sure that we could um, have some things done with the uh, by the contractor if we wanted to have it done and then how much it would cost. And that's been outlined in the, uh, the new proposal that's uh, before us tonight, authorized, and we would our request would be to authorize the manager to sign and amend the amended uh, agreement. If you have any questions, um, Rick and I will be, and Joy will be happy to answer, try to answer. <clears throat> Hearing a lot of silence. Uh, <laughs> um, a motion would be in order then. <laughs> I'd move to authorize the town manager to enter into a contract with Municipal Resources Incorporated for recruitment of a new town manager. Second. Uh, we have motions made and seconded. Is there discussion on the motion? <clears throat> if not, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? All righty. We're moving on. It will, we'll take up actually the, the annual evaluation of the, of the manager at the, at the last order of business because we'll be looking for an executive session motion at that point in time. So I guess we're on to the manager's report. So first off, you have the financial report that's included in your packet. Anyway, um, I don't think um, beyond the comments that are offered by the Finance director, that I have anything more to offer. If there's any questions, I can try to answer them, and if I can't, then we might be able to invite our finance director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> questions? Nope. All right, uh, moving along then, um, also included in your packets was the local options tax report. Yeah. And uh, this showed um, that the numbers uh, continue to be very strong. Um, we, uh, looking over this 10-year period, uh, that particular quarter, uh, we had the highest uh, returns of any other quarter. Um, the quarter that came the highest was last year. Um, and, uh, you know, it's quite a bit higher than the lowest quarter, which was in 2011. At that point, the town was still, or the, the economy was still recovering from the, the big recession. Um, but as you can 
can see there's a pretty big difference between um, 2011 and 2020. Um, also, rooms and meals uh, wasn't quite as high as last year, same quarter, but still it remains quite high. Um, and so um, overall, the numbers are very, very strong, and we're certainly going to take in more revenue, um, most likely, than what we have budgeted for the current fiscal year. And just as a reminder, um, for next fiscal year, what we did is I took a three-year average um, using the last, most recent three years, not obviously including the current year, um, as uh, the uh, what we would budget for um, rooms and meals. And there was a, a fairly large increase in that. Uh, I suggest uh, moving forward that the board will, um, as the economy goes up and down, to continue using some sort of rolling average, whether three year or five year, uh, doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, but it, it, uh, the concept's the same. And uh, that way, it kind of levels out the, the humps and the dips a little bit um, when you're using a rolling average like that. But that's for to be determined in the future. Uh, let's see, what else? This last uh, big snowstorm that we had um, uh, on uh, Friday, uh, we had quite a bit of snow in a reasonably short period of time. Um, our crew uh, was, we were down two at that point, um, and we struggled to keep up with the snow that was ranging between one and two inches per hour. And some people, we got complaints saying we hadn't plowed their street all day. Well, what had happened is if it's coming at two inches an hour and we, it takes four hours to do a route, there's eight inches of snow on the ground. And that's, that's the way it is. Um, fortunately, it's very rare that we get a storm of that nature. And so, um, but people sometimes forget uh, what it's like when you have a big storm uh, like that. But anyway, I, I think the crew did a, a good job, all things considered. And, um, Our um, sidewalk crew was really on top of it, though. <laughs> uh, new guy, and he's really, uh, uh, I saw him out today uh, doing the calling, even in the middle of the snow. So he's really staying, trying to stay on top of things. Uh, let's see. The, um, the chief of uh, the fire department provided an update um, to the board on the purchase process for the two fire trucks that were approved this past March. As a reminder, the town approved uh, the purchase, as I said, of two fire trucks. It didn't specify what kind of fire truck, but the, um, the, the police, the fire chief rather, uh, when he was making a presentation, talked about a, uh, a, a replacement for a ladder truck, which was kind of a, um, a quint, I think, which served five different functions. And then he also um, talked about another vehicle that would involve four-wheel drive, have a uh, pump, uh, pumper, tanker combination. Um, and after he did some research, and you can see that in his memo, they decided to modify that vehicle a little bit, keep it the same size, in other words, same length and height, but get rid of the four-wheel drive um, and in being able, by doing that, they were able to increase the size of the, the tank, and they felt that was more important than the four-wheel drive component piece of it. Um, and at the time that he proposed this, he said it was a two-year process, and so we're one year into it, and, and they're right on schedule as far as uh, getting the, um, the equipment ordered. And I, we do expect an order will be put in shortly, and then it takes a good year or so. Um, to get the equipment built, inspected, and then delivered. And while we're on the subject of the fire department, <laughs> the chief has uh, handed in his uh, letter of retirement, resignation, um, whatever you want to call it. Uh, he plans to finish up on July 8th. Uh, as you know, this wasn't entirely a surprise. Um, he had been talking about this for a while. Um, and uh, 
So what, I, what I'm going to do is um, I, I don't feel comfortable as the outgoing manager um, appointing the next fire chief. Um, but I think it would be probably helpful for the next person taking my position to start the process and then at some point bring in that whoever that is um, to be able to help them make the last, the, the final decision on that. Um, if the board feels differently, then I can just wait. That, that certainly is less work for me, but I, I feel like I, I could probably at least get the process started. The problem is I can't get it started too soon because I don't want a pile of resumes sitting on my desk for months because they become stale, people lose interest, they find other jobs. Um, so I, I've got to have to time this so that it's well underway, but not too far away. So that's the plan. And obviously it'll be a great loss to the community. Uh, he has um, 38 years of service and uh, it's just incredible the amount of time and effort. And I suspect that um, he won't lose total interest in the department after he retires. <laughs> I would bet you're sure that's true. <laughs> uh, let's see. Eric, did you have anything? Um, nothing, nothing else to add that we haven't addressed already. We have our um, Channel 17 budget show tomorrow evening at 525. Uh, and I guess the candidates are going to face off. <laughs> we are. Um, is that after the budget show? Yeah, starts at six. Okay. Separately or together? Together. Together. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. You can make yeah. a guest appearance and join us if you like. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank I'm going to try to get there for the budget okay. presentation. Um, so under well, anything else from manager report? I think that was it. So let's do other business and. Um, we all got a copy of what was sent by email to Joy and to Ted regarding our request for um, meetings with the select board um, other than our usually scheduled ones. And uh, perhaps either one of you or both of you could give us a little insight as to um, their request. I'm not sure that we really have a the best under I, I, I mean, these folks are clearly very unhappy with the whole development process, sure. and I think they're just looking for one. I think they were trying to understand how town governance actually works, and realizing in some ways they were going to the wrong place to try to get the answers that they needed. But now I think that they just would like to have a public vetting forum with a select board on Saturdays to discuss this. <clears throat> and, Correct me if I'm off on that. Um, yeah, the uh, the idea was that um, uh, set up a, a consistent schedule on the, throughout the idea of a Saturday morning with a select board coffee hour uh, before town hall meeting day and um, uh, apparently then I guess thereafter. Um, I. I hesitate to be against the idea, but I am against the idea. I'm completely <laughs> um, against this idea. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's, ju that's just, it's asking a lot of yeah. us to throw in it, Saturday meetings. Yeah, it is, and it's also got, um, There's there are practical reasons that I think it would not be a good idea, and that um, you we may recall that in the past, a, a moment of friction uh, has occurred when um, people have gone out and done their own research and come back with their own information. Um, this would be inviting that in many ways. Uh, this would be a situation where um, you know, one select board member would have input. Now, that happens anyway. Uh, you know, we get phone calls, we get emails, we get stopped on the street, uh, et cetera. Um, but that's, you know, that's kind of the the normal process of things, something that would be more set up as a structural thing, I think begs, uh, begs for that problem to occur. The other, the other issue would be if it is a standard thing, or even if it's not, and it's just a one-time thing, um, if, it, if you're showing up as a select board member, if two other people show up as select board members, then you have a, you have a quorum and you have an, you have an un, unwarned meeting. Um, and that, so, you know, do you say, okay, well, I'll just have two of us. Um, well, 
that's not. Uh, uh, yeah, and that, that yeah. I think it would be a, 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 I hate to say it, but I think that the answer to this is the public comment session at the beginning of the meetings. Um, if there is an issue like that, if there's an issue that people want to come to bring to the select board's attention, that's the that's structurally set up where we have to listen. Um, and in fact, we we do. And there have been times when we've had some great input, and we've had times when we've had people who are there to carry out their own somewhat bizarre agenda for 15 minutes, yelling at us about something. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, that's I think that's the right avenue to go. So I I, th I think it's a uh, it's a, a very well-intentioned idea, but I don't think it would work. Well, the email was sent out to everyone, so we all yeah. maybe got a chance to see it. And um, there are two aspects of it that, you know, one, I think we all like the idea of better communication, better fostering input, that type of thing. Um, the other was the emphasis on uh, Citizens for Responsible Growth, which to me is is about an aspect of what the town does, which is regulate development and how development can or cannot occur in town. And the other part about it is, you know, select board may not be the actual appropriate um, no, entity. That's where I was going with yeah. it, going, I don't sleep um, with the right source. Uh, the, you know, the town plan is, is the document. And, you know, for years we've been adopting down, town plans with not a lot of input from the public, a lot of input from committees formed to help, you know, with the vision, uh, a lot of input from the town commissions themselves, but from the public in general, not really. And I, I, I can't explain why. Um, um, it would be great if we got that. Um, um, so I guess I, my point is, is that there are these avenues or venues that will be available for entities like a new Citizens for Responsible Growth to have input. Um, and I hope they take advantage of it. Um, I, I think Eric might be able to explain uh, a meeting that the planning department had with, I think it was the Citizens for Responsible Growth. Yeah, um, I believe um, they held a meeting here a couple weeks ago and, mm -hmm. and Matt Belanger, our planning director, came and um, was able to answer their questions and really explain the process. And I know there's a, from a the poster, feedback, um, there's a poster on the wall there actually that they oh. use for that process. Yeah, um, I'm wondering where they Emily Heyman in our planning department is working on different infographics like this to to really illustrate the the governance roles between bodies and documents. And I believe the planning commission is. Um, looking at holding a session in March. I can confirm the date, but really a meeting just focused on uh, town growth and development and planning processes to, uh, to have the government engage in, in that dialogue to speak about. Well, the Planning Commission will the BRB, the inflection points for updating those documents and kind of how all the governance works around all those, all those areas. I think the other thing I would add is that I know, Jeff, you've been a long time advocating for the public to attend these meetings Yep. Really well. and staff can do some things. I mean, like yeah. we've done that, and we can maybe do. Even, um, I, I think we actually that. have that's, done that's a channel. Right. Yeah. Uh, our What's Up Wilston segment on it too, haven't we? Did you have Matt? Um, yeah, we, we, we talked about some of the new developments. Yeah. And I, I'm thinking about trying to. People know the board agendas are on the website, but just maybe doing a front porch forum post the Friday before. Here's the agenda. Put it on I Facebook. Great idea. Actually, uh, reach out some other areas. Our, our newest employee in the planning department actually has been doing that on Front Porch Forum um, for what's coming up on the agenda for the DRB and, and, and the Planning Commission. So Maybe putting out a link to the What's Up Williston uh, Channel 17 site on mm -hmm. the Front Porch Forum as well. Yeah. Are, are, are the select board agendas on Front Porch Forum? No, we haven't been posting those. Is that a good idea or not a good idea? It's, well, it's a good, good idea. Yeah, it, it doesn't hurt. It's just it's a little extra work that. <laughs> yes, and the, yeah, I, I I get that. It's just it is a way to get people maybe to see and be like, wait a second, they're talking about what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's uh, hard to capture people's attention sometimes with all these different ways they consume media. So I've yep. we can take a blanket approach. It's, it's, we'll see it somewhere. It's not, it, it, well, as a recent example showed, it's interesting how Front Porch Forum does capture at least a segment of the community's attention 
whether they read the whole article or not. <laughs> and we, we have a, a Facebook page. Uh, I, I was looking for something today um, specifically on that page, and there were so many posts uh, that Eric was involved in, I'm sure, um, that it took me a long time to find <laughs> it. But, and, but the point is that he's been very active in posting all kinds of things okay. on the Great. Facebook page. So Great. Yeah. interest and, and keep, help people yeah. keep people informed and as Eric just said we kind of have to use all the yeah. clients the blanket approach could have, to get the word yeah out. there's also a summary on some of his efforts as a, a little bit of a segue here in in my report to the board um, on activities for this past year okay yeah so um, my thoughts uh, were that essentially what you talked about tonight, that we do have an open session at every select board meeting to keep yeah. open and not uh, to us. Uh, and that if we were to have special meetings, we would need to have, number one, it's got to be warned. Number two, I like, would certainly want to have an agenda rather than just have an open, uh, open discussion on whatever. Uh, and um, specific dates, maybe not monthly, but uh, if we were to do it, it would be uh, less frequent than monthly, and we would have to know from the agenda who we would, from staff, that we would need to have at this kind of a meeting. So I think at this point, uh, I agree that we can invite people to come to select board meetings and uh, vent their, their uh, ire um, <laughs> uh, to us at that point. So if there's nothing more on that, our next meeting will be on St. Patrick's Day on March 17th. And uh, I, maybe some of us can wear green, but... Uh, <laughs> That's all. Which, I have to say, is also Ken Warden's birthday. Is it really? Uh, <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my. So uh, we are now at the last... Uh, Thing on the agenda, and that's the annual evaluation of the manager. And I'd be looking for a motion to go into executive session. I'd move to enter into executive session to discuss the evaluation of the town manager. And I would in, uh, actually, no, I guess I wouldn't. I'd, I'd Probably invite, in, the, invite the town manager. Town manager after uh, after he sits in the the the, the silent. <laughs> the cone of silence. Cone of silence. Of silence. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, we'll go downstairs to be in executive session. <laughs>